let's bow. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day, another day to be alive by your grace and mercy. We don't want to be familiar with your kindness and love towards us. We thank you for the ways we can know about you, particularly your word and your spirit. And we thank you for your faithfulness towards those who turn to you. And most of all, we thank you again for sending your son down for us. He became poor so that we could become rich. By grace through faith in him, we are forever grateful, Father. We ask right now that you bless this message, that you guide us, that you help us be humble before your word. We ask all these things based on the merits of Christ alone. Amen. Okay, the book of Hebrews, part 155. Um, let's see, turn in your Bibles to Hebrews 4.12. Hebrews 4.12. Let's begin with a point the Spirit keeps reminding us of over the years. And that is that the truth of the Word of God cuts both ways. I love this principle. I love how he always gives us balance and encouragement. And many principles that we hold to uh, from the Word of God, they have positive and negative results attached to them, usually depending upon our response. For example, think about how God, according to the Word, gives grace to the humble and opposes the proud. Those who respond humbly to his commands receive mercy and blessings. Those who resist him receive judgment and cursing. So the, the great thing about this whole balance, too, is that God is so reliable. And whatever he says is going to come to fruition, whether it be on the positive side or the negative side, his word is true and it holds true. And the word does cut both ways. So first, look at Hebrews 4.12. For the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and spirit, of joints and of marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. So is it any coincidence that God uses this analogy and this language about his word, in particular, the two-edged sword? First of all, we see a sword that cuts, and second, we see it has two sharp edges. And maybe, just maybe, that points to how his word does cut in both directions for us, in reliability, in both directions. So in this, we rejoice to have a God that doesn't change and is always true to his word. Can you imagine if we had a God that gave in to his emotions or waffled? all the time like we do it would be horrible because you'd never know where you stand before him but you can know where you stand because his word is so true as a prime example of cutting both ways we have the popular verse about reaping and sowing uh, turn to Galatians 6 verse 6 <clears throat> so his word cuts both ways, including reaping and sowing. Usually we tend towards the negative when we hear this verse, but did you know the context of this passage is generally positive, which the Spirit revealed to me this week, ironically, only when I went back and read this chapter a second time, but I never saw it you know, so clearly as this is meant to be a positive encouragement to us. Let's start in Galatians 6.6. 6. Let the one who is taught the word share all good things with the one who teaches. So there's a positive suggestion for us, right? You know, share with the one who teaches the word. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever one sows, that will he also reap. For the one who sows to his own flesh will from the flesh reap corruption, 
but the one who sows to the Spirit will from the Spirit reap eternal life. So there we see this principle of reaping and sowing cuts in both directions, right? Um, you, you, you do well in God's eyes, you'll be blessed. If you live selfishly or for the flesh, you'll have a curse on your hands. But then look at verse 9. And let us not grow weary of doing good, for in due season we will reap if we do not give up. So we're still on reaping and sowing, right? And we're talking about the good side right now. So then in verse 10, as we have opportunity, let us do good to everyone, and especially to those who are of the household of faith. I mean, notice even in verse 6, verses 9 and 10, are talking about doing goodness, living in the calling of God for your life, which is basically to serve others. And then you will be blessed or rewarded for it. So here we see reaping and sowing, really the emphasis is on the positive side. And talk about an invitation to do the things that glorify God. Your Father in heaven, right? He's like, not pleading with you, but like encouraging you, saying, do this good thing and do that good thing. This is your opportunity. I'm telling you, if you do this, you're going to be blessed. And he's, he's like pleading with us or encouraging us to obey his word and reap all the benefits. Yep, yep. So we see the encouragement to sow well and be rewarded. Okay? Encouragement to sow well. You sow good things, you'll be rewarded. You'll be blessed. And by the way, doesn't this sound like the guidance of a good father to you? Doesn't it sound like the guidance of a good father? Like I was reading this passage and I was a little bit overwhelmed with God as our father and his good intentions for us, his good desires for us. And God as our father wants us to flourish in life. And he wants the best for us, especially for us to possess his peace and love in our spirits. Could there be anything more valuable in this life than his peace and love? Like those are two examples of what he wants us to have more than anything. Forget about money. Forget about possessions, which is what we first think of in the flesh, right? Reaping what we sow. We want stuff. We want things. But he, in his infinite wisdom, wants us to have his peace and his love because he knows that will carry us. And that's what's really important and what's going to last, right? So now look at the very next page in your Bible to see our dear Heavenly Father's good intentions for us. This is kind of a side emphasis in tonight's message. Look at Ephesians 1.3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. So do you see the Father's joy in blessing His children? The Father has these this goodwill intentions towards His children. Blessed be the Father, God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, including His peace and His love and joy, even as He chose us in Him, before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. In love, he predestined us for adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will. Some translations there say the good purpose of his will. Talking about his goodness towards us, right? He predestined us, verse 5, for adoption to himself as sons, through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of His will, to the praise of His glorious grace, with which He has blessed us in the Beloved. So go home and read further to see the Father's goodness toward us. And in particular, we are talking about the Father here. And there are a lot of verses that talk about the Father's particular intentions and goodness towards us through the Son, through the Spirit. But do you think we should all rejoice that this is the God we serve? It's not another God. It's not a, a, an uncertain God. It's not a God who holds it over us all the time. 
It's a forgiving God. It's a merciful God. It's one who's always there ready to forgive and even bless us when we obey, as a good father would. But he does it with perfection, with perfect wisdom. But we need more faith. I don't know about you, but at times I just need more faith. I need to believe. I need to trust. I need to step back and stop trying. I was talking to Chris before service. Step back and stop trying to control everything or fix everything immediately. And instead realize God is in control and be still. Be still and know that He is God. We need more faith granted to us, which comes from God, to live in the peace and love he desires for us to live in. And we can always ask for more. And he always wants to give it. But he very often is waiting for us to ask for more. So do you remember the passage we ended with last Thursday? Probably not, but you will. Turn again to Romans fifteen thirteen. <clears throat> I love how the Spirit brings everything together, even in ways that, you know, we don't plan, or I, I didn't preconceive. And I've had a lot of miracles in my life. Oh, I'm sure. I'm sure. Mm-hmm. Just please, no talking during the service, okay? That's okay. No problem. But look at Romans 15, 13. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing. Do you remember that? Last, last uh, week that came out with emphasis. In believing, we have to believe that this is the God we have, the God of good intentions for us, the God of hope. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing so that by the power of the Holy Spirit you may abound in hope. Only by believing His Word will we abound in hope. When we lack hope, when we lack confidence, when we lack courage, when we lack these things, We're not believing the way we should. And what's the solution? Don't try to do it yourself. Don't try to muster it up by your own will. Ask him for more faith. Right? Give me more faith. Help my unbelief, as the man said to Jesus when he was healing his son. As our dear pastor always says, we also need to get out of the way. We need to get ourselves out of the way. Relying on God fully. So it's a journey. It's a process. Now, keeping in mind that the word of truth cuts both ways. Let's go again to our main passage from Sunday. All right. So we kind of just had a little foundation set with a couple different examples. But go to 2 Corinthians 13, 5. 2 Corinthians 13, 5. And this was our main theme on Sunday. Examine yourselves to see whether you are in the faith. Test yourselves. Or do you not realize this about yourselves, that Jesus Christ is in you, unless indeed you fail to meet the test? As we've heard in the past, when we examine our hearts before God, we see where our affections lie. And our allegiances lie, if we're honest with ourselves. And if we discover that we hold an affection for Christ and his good work on our behalf, then that's a good sign that we can be assured by, we can be encouraged by. You know, so again, when we step back and examine our hearts before God, right, which, again, we're reading the Bible, we see a verse like this, and we say, ooh, right? All right, let me examine myself. And when you come out of that, realizing that you have a certain affection for Christ, that should be very encouraging. That was the point from Sunday. That should be very assuring. Because you wouldn't have that affection for Christ unless it was for the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit must be in you. Otherwise, you would have an indifference to Christ. You know, you'd be like, eh, I could take him or leave him. And that's a sign of unbelief, really. So anyway, this testing thing is a good thing for a believer because it comes out the other side shining, like gold shining. We're going to get to 1 Peter again, where the gold shines brighter. Despite our sins and weakness at times, 
if we keep coming back to him, because we all fail every day, but if we keep coming back to him, that's another assuring sign. That's another affirmation that we're in Christ because we know who our Lord, Master, and Savior is, or we wouldn't be coming back to him. We wouldn't so quickly confess our sins, for example. So unfortunately, a lot of churchgoers who hold to the title of Christian aren't saved, some not even thinking they need a Savior, and some thinking they're good enough on their own. And there are even other variations of that, but they haven't trusted in Christ as their own Lord and Savior to pay for their sins. They bought a lie about their own worthiness, not surrendering to what the Word says about our sinfulness and wretchedness. So in the end, what happens is they listen to a false spirit, even from an ungodly pulpit in some churches, which is really unfortunate, but true and happening. But for us, the spirit is telling us self-examination is a good and important thing. And it comes out the other side for the believer in a very good way. For true believers, it frees them up to know they belong to him and they're in his faithful hands no matter what. For example, think of John 10. I know I've been through times recently where um, going through a tough time of lacking faith and doubt and distractions, and then even at my lowest moment, God reveals his faithfulness to me in some way, that he's there. And even that struggle and that relationship with him is an affirmation. You know, would I be going to him for help if, I wasn't his? No. <laughs> right? We'd be seeking human solutions, worldly solutions, and trying to hide from reality, right? And self-medicating, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So even that is an is a assuring thing that you go to God when things are bad, even when you're struggling, even when you see ugliness in you. For the unbeliever, when they examine themselves with a verse like this, Hopefully they realize that they're nothing on their own and they turn to Christ with a humble, repentant attitude, which is what saving faith really looks like. So a key principle for tonight, either way, the testing of one's faith leads to truth and goodness. And this was really a main emphasis from Sunday. Either way, no matter what, when you test your own faith, it leads to truth and goodness. You know, it's going to take you out of a mess you're in or a confusing situation you're in, or it's going to just boost your confidence about God's faithfulness. So, per the Spirit, we mustn't cringe when He calls us to the carpet through His Word. He calls us to the carpet through His Word. We should instead be humble and honest and seek His conviction. Right? Like, Lord, show me. Show me. Show me you with me. You know, give me a a conviction in my soul, even, my conscience, uh, only in ways that you know how you could show me that I know it's you. And it's different for each of us, but he's very personal. And how many times we don't ask for that? It says, draw near to God, right? And James say, draw near to God, he'll draw near to you. So in whatever way you know how, in your own personality, in the unique person God made you to be, draw near to God. And watch what he does. Watch what he reveals to you. But back to the key point here is that believers truly should be encouraged in Christ. Go to Hebrews 6, 9. Hebrews 6, 9. You remember that phrase, things that accompany salvation? We went over this verse in some detail. I don't know if it was a month ago now. But these things that accompany salvation may show up when you examine yourself. And we should be encouraged by those things sprouting out of us. Okay, again, think of fruit, right? Good fruit. There's certain things that sprout out of us, things that we're not even familiar with, things that we know aren't of ourselves, that God is working out in us and bringing out in us in in goodness. Look at Hebrews 6, 9 through 12. Though we speak in this way, 
Yet in your case, beloved, we feel sure of better things, things that belong to salvation. For God is not so unjust as to overlook your work and the love that you showed for his sake in serving the saints as you still do. And we desire each one of you to show the same earnestness to have the full assurance of hope until the end. See, he, God wants us to have assurance. But you have to examine yourself to see where you're at to realize assurance if you're a believer. To have the full assurance of hope until the end so that you may not be sluggish but imitators of those who through faith and patience inherit the promises. So if you pass the test when examining your heart before God, it might be because of the visible signs of saving faith, the good fruit that comes forth in your life that you know is not from yourself. So on this note, I want to share with you a couple of key points from a special message that came from this pulpit back on November 25th of 2018. And if you want to look this up and, you know, listen to it, it's on the website. You can just do a search for Saving Faith and it'll pop up there. This message was called The Visible Results of Saving Faith from 11-25-18. It says the wonderful results of saving faith include the visible miracles, quote-unquote, that occur in the lives of believers, changed lives that are totally the work of God's grace. So we all know where we come from, right? I mean, we all know our past. We all know our failures. We all know our weaknesses. The things we look back on and we cringe at that we've done or said, etc. But now, as a believer... Things are coming forth in your life that you know aren't from you. These we might call the visible miracles that are the work of God's grace in your life. And you might even be familiar with them now because you've been doing it for years now, because you've been on his narrow path. But let the Spirit bring that to your mind that you know this isn't who you are on your own. You know this is from him. And these are part of the visible results of saving faith. Another point from that message is this. We cannot see the roots of a tree of faith, just as we can't see someone's heart. But we can see the fruit of a tree of faith, which are the visible results or proofs in a believer's life. I mean, the Bible's pretty clear that, in, that if you're a true believer, there's going to be some good fruit that comes forth in your life. Like, not zero, you know? Because then God didn't change you, apparently. But if God is in you, and he's, he's changed you, and he's motivating you differently, there's going to be certain fruit that sprouts forth. And again, while we can't see the roots of faith, we can't see someone's heart, but we can see the fruit of a tree of faith, it eventually comes forth in somebody's life. So these visible fruits, what are they? The Bible talks about. Because some things you just can't see, right? Like you can't see someone's heart. Uh, you can't see if someone is... Um, Praying to God, right? Those are invisible things. But you can see things like fear of the Lord or love or obedience and even righteousness. And the Bible says these things will come forth in the lives of believers. To certain degrees, at different times, but they will come forth. So feel free to go back and listen to that message if you want to be encouraged about this topic. And, and we're talking about assurance. Right? We're talking about being assured of being in Christ Jesus. And these are part of those evidences. So, that being said, uh, we're not only told to examine ourselves, like in 2 Corinthians 13.5, but we're also told to test the spirits. So turn again to 2 Corinthians 11.4. 2 Corinthians 11.4. For if someone comes and proclaims another Jesus than the one we proclaimed, or if you receive a different spirit from the one you received, or if you accept a different gospel from the one you accepted, you put up with it readily enough. 
So there's the Apostle Paul's sarcasm coming out, trying to grab the Corinthians' attention for their error. But he was really saying to them, what are you doing putting up with counterfeits? We saw guidance from John on this as well. Go to 1 John 4, 1 again. 1 John 4, 1. Again, now we're told to test the spirits to see if they're from God or not, right? Because there's a lot of counterfeits. Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God. For many false prophets have gone out into the world. And on Sunday we saw this word for test is dokimazo, and it means to put to the test, to prove, to examine. Do you remember when the Apostle Paul went to preach in Berea? Right? After Thessalonica, he went to Berea in the book of Acts. And this is the Apostle Paul, right? I mean, shouldn't they just take every word he says for... But they didn't know this guy. It was probably the first time they met him. He was from God, but they were smart or wise to go test it in the Scriptures, right? It says they went to look it up in the Scriptures to see if what he was saying was true. So this is a very good process to put somebody to the test and see if what they're saying lines up with the Word of God. It also means to distinguish by testing, approve after testing, or establish fitness. So just like gold is examined through fire, spiritual gold, the truth of God, is revealed by testing the spirits. How do you know if it's spiritual gold, so to speak? I'm just using that term because God's blessings are far above earthly gold, right? But how do you test the gold of the truth of the word? You have to test it. You can't just take it, whatever anyone says, as being from God. You have to test the spirits. So a key principle from Sunday was that we should never be afraid to put things to the test. It's a very good and important process, and we're told to do it. So that right there should make us humble. And if you are humble, you're after the truth. And that means taking things with a grain of salt until you can prove them out in Holy Scripture. Hopefully you remember we talked about this recently. Taking or having a grain of salt attitude. Even when reading Bible commentaries or listening to Christian music or listening to other Bible teachers or looking at the study notes in the bottom of your study Bible. Take everything with a grain of salt. Don't automatically buy it hook, line, and sinker, because everybody's human, and everybody makes mistakes, even if someone's intentions are good. So we must test the spirits in the process, too, and the only way is to keep that grain of salt attitude as we learn and hear and grow. And check it out in the Word yourself. But upon testing the spirits, like the Bereans basically did to Paul, when we see goodness and truth there, and that it lines up with the word, we can rejoice and be encouraged and realize, okay, this lines up. This lines up with the word of God. And the spirits even give me a conviction and a peace that this is true. So another key principle from Sunday is that affirmation of good things is always good. But you're not going to get that affirmation unless you go through the testing process, right? Unless you put the gold in the fire and see what happens to it and see if it's genuine or not, you're not going to get that affirmation that it's true gold. And so it is with the truth of the word. So again, you're in 1 John 4, 1, right? Still there? Yeah, okay. Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God. For many false prophets have gone out into the world. By this you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God, and every spirit that does not confess Jesus is not from God. This is the Spirit of the Antichrist, which you heard was coming and now is in the world already. Little children, you are from God and have overcome them. For he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. They are from the world. 
Therefore they speak from the world, and the world listens to them. We are from God. Whoever knows God listens to us. Whoever is not from God does not listen to us. By this we know, through the testing of the spirits, by this we know the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. Now, what happens when we perceive a spirit of error? What happens if we realize when we test the spirits that something is off in a certain message someone is giving? What do we do with that? Well, it does depend on the context of the situation, and many times it's between us and God, but we're going to get to uh, a final conclusion here in a minute. Let's look at another encouraging passage on this. Turn to Acts 19.11. Acts 19.11. What do we do when we discern a spirit of error or falsehood? Ironically, first here, we're going to see, okay, listen to this. We're going to see an evil spirit test the spirit of so-called men of God. It's rather ironic. It's in reverse here. But he's testing the spirits, this evil spirit. So look at Acts 19.11. And God was doing extraordinary miracles by the hands of Paul, so that even handkerchiefs and aprons that had touched his skin were carried away to the sick, and their diseases left them, and the evil spirits came out of them. Then some of the itinerant Jewish exorcists undertook to invoke the name of the Lord Jesus over those who had evil spirits, saying, I adjure you by the Jesus whom Paul proclaims. Seven sons of a Jewish high priest named Sceva were doing this. But the evil spirit answered them, Jesus I know, and Paul I recognize, but who are you? (laughs) Isn't this funny? This evil spirit is testing these men who claimed to be of God, but apparently had no power, and he knew it. The evil spirit answered them, Jesus I know, and Paul I recognize, but who are you? And the man in whom was the evil spirit leaped on them, mastered all of them and overpowered them so that they fled out of that house naked and wounded. Again, if you ever want to make pastor laugh, just send him this passage. He thinks it's the funniest passage in the Bible, I think. But it really is comical. And these men thought they were of God and they were just apparently not filled with the spirit, apparently not uh, a granted authority over evil spirits like Paul was. And this became known, in verse 17, this became known to all the residents of Ephesus, both Jews and Greeks. And fear fell upon them all, and the name of the Lord Jesus was extolled. So that's great, right? In the end, that's great. It shows the power of Christ and his name. But then we see the response to discovering a spirit of error. Look at 19. Acts, uh, I'm sorry, Acts 19, verse 18. Also many of those who were now believers came, confessing and divulging their practices. And a number of those who had practiced magic arts brought their books together and burned them in the sight of all. And they counted the value of them and found it to be 50,000 pieces of silver. So the word of the Lord continued to increase and prevail mightily. Now please notice what these believers in Christ did not do. They did not hold on to these evil things because they were worth money. They didn't even sell them for profit like they could have. They burned them. In other words, they didn't rationalize all the money they'd be wasting away by burning them. And now, being changed by Christ, because their hearts were changed by Christ, there was a certain good fruit that came forth. What was that? They hated evil. They hated deception. They hated lies. They hated falsehood now. Because Christ changed their heart. That's a sign that they truly did turn to Christ from the heart. So being changed, they hated evil, and they didn't want this in the hands of others either. You know, we rationalize so many things away, don't we? I've done it, 
right? Where I know this thing isn't really from God anymore, so I'm going to get rid of it. But let me sell it on eBay and just make some money back. But you know it's a false spirit. You know there's a spirit of error in there, and you're going to give it to somebody else? You know? You're better off burning it. And it, we've all done these things. We've all rationalized these things away, and hopefully we then confess it and go to God and ask forgiveness, right? We repent. But as we've learned over the years, becoming a believer in Christ results in having a certain hatred for sin. And I think that hatred for sin grows more and more as we grow in the Word, you know? Let's face it, when you're a brand new believer, you don't hate sin as much as you should. As much as Christ does, right? Talk about a big difference. But you, you know, you come to Christ, you start learning. You're, you're a babe, you start taking in milk. You start learning the Word and how to think like Christ. So that hatred for sin grows and grows our hearts being for Christ. So do we fail? Of course we do, every day. But here's the key, again, we don't do, or we don't want to do the things that we do, right? That's another affirmation or assurance that you're in Christ. That when you do fail Him, you're, you're repentant. And you don't want to do the things you do wrongly. That's Romans chapter 7. But rather, we repent right away as believers because we seek restoration with our Heavenly Father. Like, we don't want to be separated from the Father for that time, you know, where we're out of line and rationalizing, whatever. A believer will come right back to God and just be like, Father, I'm sorry, I did it again. But this is also a form of assurance that you come back to God. If you weren't a believer, you wouldn't come back to God. You'd be indifferent. You'd be like, eh, it's okay. I'm sure God, God loves me. He'll overlook it anyway. And that flippant kind of attitude is a sign of, dare I say, unbelief. But a form of assurance is that you actually care about what God thinks and that you want to be right with Him. And you know that our good Father is there every time for us with mercy and forgiveness. Every single time. Which makes us want to serve Him more and love Him more. Remember in 1 John chapter 4 that there is no fear in love. In fact, you're still in 1 John 4, right? I think it's in verse 16 or 17. Or oh, did I move you? Oh, sorry. You don't have to go there. But just remember 1 John 4, you can go read it later. There is no fear in love. And in John 16, the Father himself loves you, Jesus said. The Father himself loves you. So let that motivate you. But what happens when we test the spirits and perceive a spirit of error? We reject it and get away from it so that we're not dragged down. And also we're aware to help protect others around us from such lies. We actually care that others aren't going to be dragged down or deceived as well. So, changing gears a little bit, we all need to be encouraged, right? <laughs> and that's one main reason God has given us pastors and teachers. Like, he didn't just say, go read your Bible. He also gave you pastors and teachers to encourage you and guide you, to guide the ship a little bit for you. You know, men with a gift like our pastor has to, to shepherd, you know, to lead, to guide. Um, we all need that encouragement. And these believers in the Hebrew church were under so much pressure, as we know, they really needed a good shepherd to guide them and to remind them of the power of Christ in their lives. If you have Christ, you have it all, he was telling them. You know, stop, stop worrying about what the Jews want to do to you who are surrounding you from without and want to ruin your lives even kill some of you. Don't worry about that. You have the power of Christ, and when you have Christ, you have it all. That's what he kept reminding them over and over in different ways. So a key principle from Sunday was this. For a true believer in Christ, possessing an assurance of faith is a wonderfully settling, heartfelt reality. Right? Again, this is why it's so valuable to test, examine yourself before God. You get this 
settling heartfelt reality of being in Christ and knowing that he'll never leave you or forsake you. But that comes through that process of self-examination. Turn again to 1 Peter 1.3. Again, for a true believer in Christ, possessing an assurance of faith is a wonderfully settling, heartfelt reality. And here's Peter encouraging those who are born again and saved. 1 Peter 1.3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. So we're back to God the Father again. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to His great mercy, the Father, He has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials, so that the tested genuineness of your faith, and this is what leads to affirmation or assurance for God's children, right? The tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. In other words, when your faith passes the test, you bring glory to Jesus Christ in that moment, and you're going to see it at the revelation of Jesus Christ one day. Though you have not seen him, you love him. Though you do not now see him, you believe in him and rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory. Obtaining the outcome of your faith, the salvation or deliverance of your souls. What a passage. And this is a relief to those who believe in Christ. If you're a believer and you read this passage, you're encouraged by this passage, even though it involves testing. You're encouraged because of the promises of the outcome and where it's going to go for you because God is faithful, basically. Not because of you, but because God is faithful to those who are His. So we receive assurance in our hearts when we agree with Holy Scripture. So here's a key principle from Sunday, and this one's a mouthful, so just please listen. Um, really wonderful thing to think about. Assurance of faith is a beautiful gift from God to His children. It is how He extinguishes the malicious attempts of doubt to rob His beloved of an eternal joy that is theirs to cling to always. Therefore, do not be afraid to put your faith to the test, Knowing the outcome is a friendly reminder that God especially loves you. The Father is trying to reveal His love to us. And it's often through testing and self-examination. But this is a gift from God, this assurance, this confidence that you're in His hands. Even when you, you just blow it. You just really blow it in a certain situation. But then you run to him as a child, to a father, and then he reassures you, and he forgives you, and you know it. That's assurance. That's uh, what he wants you to have, and he wants you to know that he especially loves, loves you. But without the testing of your faith, we don't, we don't see that next step. You know, we talk about like an increased level of surrender towards God as we grow, and we get closer to death and going home to be with the Lord, He brings us slowly uh, to that increased level of surrender. But you have to go through these things, right? These tests, these failures to realize His incredible faithfulness and His incredible love. So now, as we begin to close, turn to Hebrews ten nineteen. Here's a good summary verse, more encouragement from Hebrews again, which I'm sure we'll get to coming up. But of everything we've been talking about recently, 
Hebrews 10, 19. Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain, that is, through his flesh, and since we have a great high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith. Do you see it? Draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith. With our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. And that's really what it comes down to. He who promised is faithful. As it says in Hebrews 13, 8, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He's not going anywhere and he's not changing. Thank God. And that's where we get our assurance from ultimately. All right, let's go back to Hebrews 7 now as we just have a couple more points before we close. Go to Hebrews 7, 11. <clears throat> now, if perfection had been attainable through the Levitical priesthood, Hebrews 7, 11, if perfection had been attainable through the Levitical priesthood, for under it the people received the law, what further need would there have been for another priest to arise after the order of Melchizedek, rather than the one named after the order of Aaron? For when there is a change in the priesthood, there is necessarily a change in the law as well. Now let's pause just for a moment and notice the word perfection in verse 11. It's very easy to skip over with all that we've been talking about, but it's a huge point to be made regarding our great need for the Savior because perfection is the requirement of God. What did Jesus say in Matthew 5, 48? You therefore must be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. And this is why the Bible says if we break just one part of the law, we're accountable for the whole thing. What does that tell you? Perfection is the requirement in James 2.10. So, therefore, the need for a perfect priest who could make a perfect sacrifice once for all on our behalf. And the good news is, like the writer of Hebrews was trying to tell these people in this small church, you have him. You have him. It's Christ. He's the perfect priest who made the perfect sacrifice. When you have him, you have everything. You don't need to worry. Stop worrying. Stop, uh, you know, lacking faith. You have Christ. You have the Messiah, the one you've been waiting for. So as we've been learning also, Jesus even fulfilled the law so that we could now be under a different law, the law of love by his grace. Just look at verse 17 as we close. For it is witnessed of him, you, Jesus here, you are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. For on the one hand, a form of commandment is set aside because of its weakness and uselessness. For the law made nothing perfect. But on the other hand, a better hope is introduced through which we draw near to God. Again, last week we talked about this being an infinitely better hope because it's actually a perfect hope not a faulty hope or a temporary hope in any way so my friends we must realize and come come to terms in our hearts that jesus christ himself is the source of all encouragement in, in this life it doesn't matter what part of life you're struggling with it doesn't matter what your test or your suffering is in Jesus Christ is the source of all encouragement in this life. He's conquered all, even death, once for all. So no matter what we face, he wants us to have assurance in him. Assurance. And that brought out the key principle from Sunday. A saved person is a grounded person. We are grounded in Christ forevermore. The Bible says we're in union with Christ forevermore and that no matter what our faith will win out in the end even through the trials and the failures and the doubts and the falling back 
our faith will win out in the end, being in Christ. Because we have the perfect one. And he's the one holding us up. So go to 1 John 5, 4. 1 John 5, 4. Just as a reminder that our faith will win out in the end, no matter what, if you're a believer. For everyone who has been born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. Who is it that overcomes the world except the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God? Now you might think, wait a minute. In verse 4, this is the victory that has overcome the world. Our faith, right? Uh Uh-oh, the pressure's on me. Is my faith strong enough? But that's not the way it works. Because faith comes from God. Even the faith we have, as we've well learned over the years, is from God. No matter what, your faith, which God continually provides for you, will conquer all in the end. And I love 1 Peter 1.5 here. I love this reminder, which we've already read, but I'll just read it to you. 1 Peter 1.5 says, Who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. It is by God's power that our faith sustains us, even through the failures. It's by God's power that we come back to Him. It's by God's power that our faith is increased so that we have the full hope of assurance till the end. It's a process. Don't get me wrong, right? It's a sanctification process. It takes time. It takes going through things. But rest assured that your faith is not of yourself. It's from God's power. And by His very power, He's guarding us through that faith until the end and everything will be revealed. The Lord is the one who saves us. And the Lord is the one who keeps us saved. That's the point. And that's why all the glory belongs to God. Period. Amen? All right, let's end there. Father God, we thank you so much. You're such a good Father who cares about us and has good intentions for us and has done everything possible to not only save us but to bless us. And especially with the things that are most important, your joy and your peace and your hope and your love. Father, we thank you and we ask you for more faith as well, that we believe everything your word says about your promises towards us in Christ Jesus. We ask that you bless us and assure us and encourage us and help us fight the good fight of faith until we see you face to face. All to your glory, because it's by your power that we are being guarded through faith until everything is revealed in the last time. Father, to you be the glory forever and ever. Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, we pray by the power of your Spirit. Amen.